Okay, well, I have 19 or 701, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Sandy Duchesne, and on behalf of the Penobscot Valley Chapter, I'd like to welcome you to our free monthly program. Unfortunately, still on Zoom, we'd like to be back in person, but on a cold and snowy February night, it's probably not so bad to have people be able to join us here. Uh, we're very excited to have Kelsey Sullivan from Inland Fisheries and Wildlife here with us. And before we get started, I just want to go over a couple of housekeeping items and then also mention some upcoming programs that we have on tap. Uh, first of all, for housekeeping, uh, because this is a webinar, only the panelists show and have um, talking access. So we'd like you to use the chat for any comments you have or communicating with each other or with any of the panelists, but use the Q&A, which is two buttons over from the chat at the bottom of your screen for any questions that you'd like to ask Kelsey directly. And he has requested rather than store them up for the end of the program, like we usually do, he'd actually like to receive your comments and questions as they come in. So I won't, be monitoring the chat as closely as I do the Q&A. So if you want your question to be answered by Kelsey, please put it in the Q&A. And uh, having said that, I'll go ahead and talk about some programs. Exactly one month from tonight on May 4th, we'll have Doug Hitchcock from Maine Audubon talking about the ethics of birding in the modern age. And we're looking forward to that program. Uh, at Fields Pond over the next month on Saturday, February 12th, there'll be an outdoor tracking walk, guided walk on and probably a snowshoe given what we've got out there for conditions right now. Then on February 18th, there'll be a midnight snowshoe hike. I think that's the full moon. So if you'd like to go on a moonlight snowshoe hike with the staff from Fields Pond Audubon Center. That's your opportunity February 18th. And finally, from February 22nd to 25th, I don't know if there are any seats available. It's limited to 12 students from grades one to five, but they are having a February school vacation camp at Fields Pond. And if you're interested in that, you can contact uh, Fields Pond either on the phone is 989-2591 or it's on the web. So having said that, I'm going to introduce Bob, my Bob Duchesne, who's also on the board of Penobscot Valley Chapter, and he'll introduce Kelsey. Take it away, well, Bob. Thank you. I, yeah, thanks. I am Bob Duchesne. For those of you who don't know me, why not? Um, I don't know how many people realize that Maine has officially four big game species, moose, deer, bear, and wild turkey. And uh, Kelsey Sullivan, of course, is the wildlife biologist and game bird specialist who's in charge of all this. Uh, so he oversees all of our game birds. But one of them is, in fact, um, considered a big game management species in Maine. And so it gets uh, additional attention and bringing the turkey back to Maine and then uh, how to manage some to simply overrun the area and other places it's colonizing where you never would have thought it was there before. Uh, must be an interesting challenge, and I would like to hear all about it from a uh, game bird specialist, Kelsey Sullivan. Kelsey? Well, thanks, Bob and Sandy. Appreciate folks tuning in tonight. Um, I would mention that Sandy noted that you're welcome to ask questions as we go through the presentation, and also, you know, if you want to save questions for the end, there should be some time for the end. So, uh, with that, um, so. What I'd like to present today is the wild, a wild turkey story um, or the wild turkey story for Maine. And I'll go over a bit of history of where turkeys were or weren't in the past um, and then get into some research that we've done more recently um, related to um, some publicly derived goals from a management uh, um, a new management plan for big game species, as Bob noted, turkeys are big game species. And then sort of the next steps, which is kind of the next uh, 
the next move after our research that we've just completed most recently um, last year. So I guess with that, I'll get into it. Uh, as Bob noted, um, I'm a wildlife biologist for Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. I cover waterfowl, woodcock, uh, turkeys, and grouse. Um, I'm in the bird group and I work in partnership with several other biologists within the department as well as other agencies. So even though I'm the, the lead for the, the program, I work with quite a few other people to, for the success and the management of turkeys. So we'll get right into it. Hopefully I can move my internet along here. Kelsey, while you're doing that, you already have your first question from Christy wants to know, how can we best support our local turkey flock? We have one group and also a lone tom. We provide cracked corn and water. Anything else we can be doing? Thanks, great program. Uh, no, I think, uh, you know, putting out, a little, putting out a, some food is, is okay. Actually, that's probably why we have a robust population is a little bit of assistance from people. I would just say um, to be cautious if, there are some diseases that run through birds so that if you saw a bird that was lethargic and kind of separated from another other bird or another species that you might consider um, curbing feeding if you want to reduce the risk of other species. So there's always a risk with feeding wildlife and that's, you know, I, I don't discourage it, but I say just do it cautiously. And for some reason, my screen isn't advancing. There we go. Okay. Um, so we'll start out, we'll start the story out two to three million years ago. So this is the earliest fossil record of the ancestral form of wild turkey um, found in Texas and Kansas. That was the ancestor of what we have today. Um, you know, of course, people have been interacting with wildlife and turkeys since people and turkeys and wildlife have been on the landscape together. Um, in indigenous cultures, wild turkey were used quite a bit. Um, as you'd know, note and see that uh, headdresses and, and ceremony feathers were used. Um, they also used bones for awls and needles. I also put down here in the bottom right corner more of a modern use of wild turkey bone. This is a turkey call used during the turkey hunt for um, you can simulate a sound of a, of a hen, um, but I'm guessing that uh, indigenous cultures also probably use that for, for pursuit of turkeys for food. Um, when I was doing a little more background research, I came across this reference to IPM. So we think of that as, you know, integrated pest management, um, which can be complicated with different insect species and other wildlife, but the Indigenous cultures did use turkeys as what we, we would consider IPM or integrated pest management um, to reduce, you know, for uh, it, interactions and negative effects of, of different uh, invertebrates, bugs and things. They, they didn't um, tame turkeys, but they encouraged the use in their, uh, their different landscapes. Um, I put food as a very small uh, word because really from what i understand from literature and research is that turkeys were opportunistically taken by uh, indigenous cultures um, they weren't as robust as what we see on the landscape today so um, you know if they encountered a, a turkey they would might take it for food but it wasn't like a staple or a mainstay uh, food resource for for those folks um, so when European settlement occurred and folks came across the ocean and colonized the United States, there was no turkeys where they came from. So they really didn't have a name for it, which was kind of interesting. So they came up with the, their Latin name is Maligris Galapavo Silvestris, which means basically they said, this looks like a Guinea peafowl like forest kind of bird. So. That's the origin of the name because they did not have uh, wild turkey like as we know in the old world, like we do in the new world. So picture yourself back um, with European settlement 
this is probably what most of New England and the, the country looked like. Um, there weren't a lot of clearings. It was mostly forested. And we did have turkeys back then, um, probably in, in, in smaller numbers than what we do have today. But um, we're, I'm setting the stage for turkeys in the past leading into the future. But European settlement occurred. And this is what the landscape looked like in late 17th century or 1700s, 1800s, basically a near clearing of, of most of New England. And um, that uh, resulted in the loss of part of what turkeys require for habitat, which is some forest cover. Uh, this with over hunting led to basically in the late 1800s, turkeys didn't exist in, in Maine. It, they did exist in pockets in a few states south of us, but for the most part, most states who had turkeys before European settlement lost them because of um, clearing and overhunting, unregulated hunting, to what we term extirpation, which is something that used to be here that doesn't exist anymore. So um, early 1900s, mid 1900s turkeys didn't exist in Maine. So there was a few things that led to turkeys being restored successfully. And um, I guess it's a good example of how people and interests influence the uh, success, the conservation of things that we care about. But um, industrial Re revolution occurred in the early 1900s. Um, so folks left the farm and things started to grow back again. So that integral part of the turkey habitat, that forest cover started to regenerate. Um, in 1937, a pre pretty key um, act of uh, federal acts for providing federal aid and wildlife restoration by Pittman and Robertson, basically the excise tax equaled about 11% off of the sale of firearms, uh, ammunition and sporting equipment that was dedicated to be uh, disseminated to states for the use of wildlife conservation management um, and basically species conservation. Um, following World War II, there was a workforce that was ripe and ready to get on the ground and put some energy into things that were important to them. Um, there was an interest in restoring species like wild turkey that once existed that didn't exist anymore. So you had um, this funding to put towards conservation and management of species like turkey, which basically led to um, resources for uh, what efforts to, to figure out a way to bring turkeys back to the um, to the states that don't, didn't have them anymore. Um, I note that from the 1940s to the 1970s, there was a long period of time when things like game farm birds were being experimented with, released onto the landscape. But basically what, what happened was these birds didn't have a wild, these wild traits that were required to survive out in the wilderness or out in the natural world. So there was a thing that, um, really allowed for the success of wild turkey restoration. These are birds that were captured in other states and brought to Maine. Um, this, I have a video, I hope it plays, but this, the invention or the, the use of cannon net, rocket nets to trap birds from other states and then box them up and bring them to Maine and release them is uh, how it all worked, the real success of the program. So basically you're baiting in front of a group of birds, you shoot a net over them and run out, box them up and then load them into a truck and drive them up to, to Maine. So I just have some statistics on number of birds and when we received um, turkeys. 1977, 78, so the winter of 77, 78, uh, 41 turkeys came from Vermont and they were released in the towns of York and Elliott, so Southern Maine. 1982 through 84, the successful reproduction of these birds that were released in Southern Maine allowed for enough of a population to start moving them um, 
in the 20, about, there was a leapfrog effort. So er, you'd move them out 20 miles and, and then establish another breeding population, then capture birds at that site and then move them further out. So that's um, how the department aided in the movement and, and expansion of turkeys. Um, in 1987 and 88, so the winter of 87, 88, 70 birds were obtained from Connecticut and then released again into Maine. Um, and this was, this continued in, um, it was about anywhere from 50 to 100 birds a year up through 2011 that were moved throughout the state with that leapfrog program of moving 20 miles out and then establishing and moving 20 miles out again. So um, that was the real uh, success of, of reestablishing turkeys was through the, the aid of trap and transfer. So now today, if you go to any county and not in every corner of every county, but in, 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 in each county, there's at least some turkeys um, you'll fi you'd find. There was a report of a recent turkey, uh, I think he's 20 miles northeast of Jackman out in the uh, North Main Woods uh, last week. So they're, they're, they're dispersing. Um, but this is really what would be considered their core range, which is where the strongest of the greatest number and highest density of turkeys are, which actually mimics what the historic range was considered prior to extirpation. Um, I'm going to just, I'm not going to read all this. I just wanted to throw, I have two slides that these are basically trying to illustrate that um, in introducing a wild turkey um, hunt program was a slow and steady conservative approach. You can see from 1986, from the first hunting season, annually some things were changed and different parts of the state were added for turkey hunting, but it wasn't just a carte blanche, open the, open the state to turkey hunting. It took uh, several decades. So this next slide is just illustrating that. So, you know, continuing with slow and steady, um, making sure that there was an over harvest and that populations were establishing over time, which led us to <clears throat> most recently that 2016, 17, those highlighted um, references was when we started to shift from a restored population to an abundant population. And as many folks out there in Maine see, there's lots of pockets of uh, large groups of birds. And so we've transitioned from restoration to ma active management, <clears throat> excuse me. And how, we're, how we approach that is through this um, big, big game management plan, which um, was informed by a public survey uh, led by responsive management in 2016, which is gonna be kind of the rest of my talk is to talk about the approach and moving forward with this big game management plan for turkeys. As uh, Bob mentioned, Maine does have four big game species and turkeys are included in that. Um, so they are afforded um, a significant amount of attention by the department, but also in the legislature, you'd be surprised at how much um, the Fish and Wildlife Committee talks about turkeys and, and managing turkeys and what we should do for turkeys, but they, they, uh, they receive quite a bit of attention. Um, so that responsive management survey, as I mentioned, was something that we wanted to start as a baseline as to see the perspective and um, opinions about turkeys in Maine, turkey management, um, population sizes, and sort of direct us towards what we should try, be trying to achieve in terms of managing at what level of turkeys are accepted or desired by uh, Mainers, basically. Um, uh, one of the questions was to kind of help us understand folks' perspectives on how they thought Maine or the department was managing turkeys. And we had a 70% rating of excellent or good, which was pretty good when you look across other states and their turkey programs. That was actually a pretty high rating. Um, another question that sort of helped us kind of derive some objectives and goals was what folks wanted to see in terms of what a population size was compared to what it is now and what, what it should be in the future. 
Um, Sixty percent of folks that were asked uh, would like would would like to see Turkey stay the same at the time in 2016. Ten percent wanted to see an increase in the Turkey population, and thirty percent wanted to see a decrease. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, several different reasons in terms of crop depredation and perceived negative interactions of turkeys on other species like grouse and deer. Um, I say perceived because there's not a raw, real support for that kind of negative uh, interactions turkeys might have on other species. Um, uh, another question was whether folks were supportive of legal turkey hunting for population management, and it was pretty high, 92 to 99 percent, and those variations are related to landowners, hunters, and the general public. There was three categories that were asked the, the same question. 92% uh, of turkey hunters were satisfied with their turkey hunting that they've experienced up until 2016. So uh, part of the big game management plan was we um, assembled a committee, a steering committee and subcommittees for each each species, moose, bear, deer, and turkey, and then derived these goals based that were informed by the uh, responsive management uh, survey. And um, one of the goals was to sustain the population through research and management. Uh, another goal was social caring capacity, recognizing that landowner and public support was important and that was based on perspectives of acceptance of what level of turkeys are would be on the landscape. Um, the department recognized that turkey hunting for it to be successful in in uh, achieving management goals was there needed to be some effort to promote wild turkey hunting and its value. Um, there's uh, about twelve thousand active or dedicated wild turkey hunters and. The population itself, now that it's abundant, could afford more harvest. So that was where that goal came from. And then in general, um, outreach and education on turkey, general turkey biology, ecology, and management would help um, help the citizens of Maine understand wild turkeys and so and which would further support um, our efforts for turkey management. So the rest of the talk I'm going to talk about these other goals are ongoing. We have an outreach and education department and um, uh, recruitment program for for hunting, not just turkey, but other other species. But my role is really to focus on research and management. And so I'm going to the rest of the talk is going to cover what we uh, what we've done to approach that or address that goal. Um, so within that goal, there's some, a few different objectives. Objective one, to stabilize wild turkey populations in portions of southern and central Maine. So that was out, came out of the questions from the responsive management survey where, if you remember, there was responses of decreasing the population, the desire to decrease the population. And that came from where you'd expect the most, um, the, the, the highest density of, of turkeys occurred where there's uh, more negative interactions in terms of property damage and, and perspectives where there's more turkeys. So to try to stabilize that section of the population. And then recognizing that there's a lot of other parts of the state where the densities aren't as high and that, that we could afford or we could, um, we could try to achieve a higher higher level of turkey populations in northern, eastern, and western Maine. Um, we wanted to develop and improve techniques to monitor wild turkey population trends. As I noted before, prior to uh, 2015, we were really approaching wild turkey management as a conservative uh, restoration effort. And now that we're into this abundant population, we want to have uh, scientifically sound uh, methods to monitor and and make recommendations for wild turkey hunting and conservation um, beyond just reactive to um, perspectives. 
Um, and then improve the quality and availability of wild turkey harvest data. So having a more precise and reliable um, system um, or accurate or, or evaluate the current system we have, I guess is really what we're trying to do. And to see if there was a need for more effort to improve the availability of wild turkey harvest data. And then the looking at the wild turkey hunt itself, it's always been a priority of the department based on perspectives of wild turkey hunters that spring, the spring wild turkey hunt is an important hunt that want, that folks want to maintain, that we want to maintain um, and uh, continue to maintain a spring hunt for whatever we do in terms of management and trying to um, increase or stabilize populations that we, the core goal is to really maintain the quality of the spring wild turkey hunt. Kelsey, um, we have another question. Sure. Um, uh, an anonymous attendee wants to know if avian pox is causing a decrease in the main turkey population. Um, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. Um, so what we found, and it, um, it kind of rings true for a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of abundant uh, wildlife species is, we did have a pulse of avian pox in 2012 and 2013. And that was when our densities were highest across the state, significantly higher than it had been before. And what I think happened, which makes sense, is that <clears throat> um, Mother Nature kind of corrected things a little bit and, and kept the population in check. Avian pox itself can affect individuals negatively and cause mortality, but for the turkey population that we've seen in Maine, there wasn't, um, it wasn't, it didn't decimate the turkey population. There's enough resistance and ability of most of the population to to withstand and survive pox. So I guess the long winded answer could be summarized in short that our population is strong enough that that pox um, isn't going to really negatively influence the overall population trend over time. Thank you. And we do have a second question related to your last slide, which is why is the spring hunt popular? Uh, yeah, that's a uh, Spring hunt is popular because it's an interactive hunt where you're basically trying to emulate a wild turkey female during the breeding season so that it's a it's a pretty intense I, I guess I could speak as per, from personal experience being a spring turkey hunter is that um, it's a very interactive um, you know I guess what's the term? Uh, not primal, but almost primal experience where you're you're in in the system of wild turkey breeding, and you're basically um, the intensity and the, the the challenge of trying to bring turkeys to your decoys and things like that is pretty. Um, that's that's why I think it's pretty popular. Okay, well, Diane has a follow up qu question to that, which is, wouldn't the taste of meat reflect the winter diet of the turkeys in, in the spring hunt? Um, yeah, actually, that's another good question. I don't think they're eating much in the spring. Um, I think they're focused on breeding more than anything. So, um, but I would think that by the time the spring hunt is on, they, the winter diet's probably shifted already, but, the, but they, like I said, they're not eating a lot during the, during the spring hunt either. Okay, I'll move on. Thanks for the questions. Um, so getting back to the that goal of in deriving uh, sound science, we're moving forward with a more active management program. Um, we really wanted to get an idea of main specific uh, wild turkey biology and ecology. And there's a lot of data and uh, literature out there for other states, but we wanted to start with a baseline for our system um, through research. So we were interested in at looking at uh, topics like nesting, timing of nesting, success of nesting, 
habitat use across this uh, different gradients of landscapes from open open landscapes to forested landscapes, um, looking at annual survival and how that would relate to harvest rates. And if our annual survival that we measure is sustainable for the harvest rates that we have. Um, and also to the, in some the person that asked about pox was that there is a disease component that's important to consider and how that affects um, all of the above nesting and survival and harvest. And then ultimately to come up with a, uh, a, a population estimate that we were comfortable with, that we were, um, that we felt was um, reliable um, to move forward with uh, any type of increased opportunity for hunting or or curbing hunting to protect some some pockets of the population. All all with the goal to inform this new conservation management regime that we're we're in with turkeys now. So in 2018, we worked with uh, a few different groups to we came up with this research project um, titled Population Estimation, Harvest Management, and Landscape Spatial Ecology of Wild Turkeys in Maine, which is a big, long title for basically trying to understand how many turkeys we have, um, the harvest levels that we're experiencing, are they sustainable, and how they use the, the landscape that they're, they're in um, throughout their annual life cycle. So we worked with the University of Maine Dr. Eric Longberg and Dr. Pauline Kamath with, um, we br they brought on a graduate student each. Um, Matt, Matthew Vonneman was the population dynamics student and Stephanie Shea was the disease ecology student. So they both have completed their um, PhD programs and moved on. But we also had support from the National Wild Turkey Federation for the purchase of um, some of the equipment that we used. <clears throat> and then of course, as I mentioned back um, in my one of my earlier slides, the success of the restoration of wild turkeys occurred through the Pittman-Robertson Act, which is basically this wildlife wildlife and sport fish restoration is the Pittman-Robertson Act. Um, so we were able to use a significant number amount of funding from that those monies that we continually use for all of our programs to support this research. So the exciting stuff started to happen. Um, we started catching birds, like I showed in that video of trap and transfer. We used the same methods where we would catch birds with rocket nets. And we got these uh, GPS transmitters from the National Wildlife Turkey Federation. And this is um, a hen turkey with a GPS transmitter attached, basically like a backpack. So she's, she's got um, a harness that goes over or under her both both of her wings, and she carries that throughout her um, annual life cycle. This uh, once you put this unit on to a turkey, the beauty of the GPS units because we use different types of units for other things too. But the beauty of the GPS unit is once you put it on the on her, you don't have to pursue her or try to track her down. Again, you can go and remotely download data that's sent to satellites and collected. Um, so that's uh, the value of the GPS unit. They, of course, the one thing with GPS units is they're pretty expensive. So uh, we also use radio telemetry units, which were units that you'd have to go out and actively track birds, and um, but they were more, uh, they were less expensive. So <clears throat> what we did was we set up these three study areas. Uh, two study areas, and one of them was a had a subset of study areas, but trying to get at the, the uh, question of how they use the landscape throughout the year. Um, <clears throat> the northern study area consisted of, uh, on the left, the orange Exeter Corinth, which was considered northwest and mostly agriculture. Uh, the light blue um, section or subsection of that northern study area was the Orono Bangor area. So we were interested in how turkeys interacted with the urban landscape and backyard feeders and, and how they traversed across into these other um, 
landscapes. The Stud Mill Road, which is Milford and East, was considered the forested area. So, you know, and all of these areas have a subset of agriculture, urban, and forest, but predominantly they were agriculture, urban, forested. And then we wanted to, you know, like any um, good study, you focus on another part of the state that, that it does have a little bit of a different climate and, and to see if that had an influence on um, the things that were interested in survival and nesting <clears throat> um, over time. So that's the study area. This is just a little animation of one of the GPS units we use. So on the left, you see all those blue circles with the bullseyes. That's where um, this female was marked in the winter time. And so she had a winter range of a, a mile and a half or so. And then over the course of the spring, she started to move and disperse. So she's moving uh, six miles away from where her wintering site was. And then this is where she set up shop for nesting. So um, this was um, good information for us for managing at a wildlife management district level because this six miles was about average of how far a female would travel from wintering site to nesting area. But we had some birds that were moving 20 miles and some birds that were moving two miles. So there was quite a range, but I guess the take home was is that they're moving quite a bit. So the turkeys you see in the winter time um, may be six to 20 miles away from where you see them uh, during the nesting season. So they're using quite a bit of landscape between winter and nesting. Um, I just wanted to throw this one in because it was pretty interesting. So this female was marked in Munson in 2020, March 2020. And so on the bottom of the screen is her where she was captured. And then in May, she turned up and nested in Kakajo 28 miles away. So this gets at sort of the answer of why we're seeing birds in Jackman and other places is that, you know, they're dispersing quite a bit um, for nesting and then she returned back to Munson for her wintering, uh, wintering area. So some things about nesting that we were interested in. Uh, we monitored 120 nests with radio transmitters. Um, average dates of in initiation is important for how our season is set. Um, so that was a really important question we wanted answered is, you know, we have a spring season that potentially if it's placed in the wrong part of the breeding season could significantly um, influence negatively the success of reproduction for turkeys and then um, compromise the spring hunt and compromise the population overall. So our season generally runs and starts May 1st. And so the, you see first nest attempt was April 30th. They did they did, we did have some re-nesting re if, if they failed. So they they only raise one clutch um, a year. So um, they're, they're not, if they fail the first time, they do try again. And we've had a, we had one try a third time, but, but the take home really here was that our season is timed for when most females have, have bred or fertilized and are already um, nesting. So that we felt, we feel confident that that May 1st start date is, is uh, sustainable. Um, overall nest success was 31%, which falls within the realm of several other studies that have been done. Um, so our, our nesting success is, is um, on par with a lot of other states. <clears throat> uh, I just wanted to throw in some this was kind of one of the highlights of being a research biologist is getting out and following these birds and finding out where they're nesting and the habitats they're using. And I don't have a blow up, but if you walked to the left of the this patch of uh, cattails, you'd be on Route 26 in Gray, um, 20 feet away. So they they nest all over from deep in the woods to along along roadsides, and then. You know, they're pretty cryptic coloration, um, camouflage nesting. So 
you wouldn't necessarily know they're there unless you're following with a radio transmitter antenna. Kelsey, um, this Bob, is just wants, Bob yes. wants to know, Bob would like to know if you could define nest success. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, nest success is um, the proportion of eggs that a female incubates to hatch. So that's what we were calling nest success. Um, so 31% of the nests we tracked at least made it to hatching and um, the 24 hour period that they stay in the nest and, and then move out and are on the landscape mobile. So that's nest success. So would that be like, if one chick makes it, then that's nest success? Um, yeah. No, that's a good question. So yeah, uh, nesting success was the ability to, to uh, pull off a successful hatch. It could have been one, it could have been nine. So there's more specifics that you could get into, but we were saying at least, you know, at least one, but in general, it was um, four to five um, eggs would hatch successfully to mobility. Thank you. So that's where she is. So this, this is a bird that I walked up on and I didn't even know she was there until I was three feet away. This is just another um, shot just to show that um, clutch size is variable and but in general they average about 12 eggs per nest. Um, an interesting little fact too is that the second attempts generally are seven eggs so they you know they've expended energy to to lay um, their first nest and they <laughs> don't have the sources to lay more so the more I guess one thing to consider is the more disturbance and um, failure you may see less of a, a reproductive abundance that year. Um, one thing that we did was to sorry I've got a bird in the background here. Um, one thing that we did uh, to understand the age of the nest and try to get at when when nests were initiated. I'm going to move here. Oh, maybe not. Uh, so you can float eggs, and um, like any any chicken egg, if you put it in water, it's going to sink. But if it's fertilized and there's more oxygen in in the egg, it'll eventually become buoyant and float. You can estimate when um, turkeys are ready to hatch. Hold on. Sorry, I got a friend here. Let's see if he quiets down. <laughs> uh, so apologies. Um, another thing that we did was we put bands on birds. Um, and this was related to estimating harvest. So you get a number of bands reported um, in a harvest. And you know the number of birds that you banded. So you can estimate proportion of harvested that are versus not. And you can get a harvest rate from that. <clears throat> Um, I'm getting hung up here. Yeah, having technical. Sorry. There we go. My apologies. Uh, just to show you that. Um, this is just a diagram or a, a figure to show the amount of banding that we did and the distribution to try to get at harvest rate across the state. Um, the blue circles are where we banded birds and the purple triangles are where we put transmitters on birds. So those are the study areas that I showed before um, just to try to get a, a wider representation of, of harvest is why we expanded the, the banding beyond the, the telemetry study area. Um, we did put two, we put GPS units on two males 
um, that we had. There were um, older units that we didn't know were going to continue to be working. So we wanted, and we were interested in male movement um, between winter and uh, nesting. And you can see that this is actually the Bangor area down on the left, where the one one male was marked, and then another one was marked on the uh, Witter Farm in Orono. But this just shows that there's quite a bit of movement um, for males across the landscape too. So um, just helped us, or helped us understand that the flocks that we see in the winter time are really moving quite a bit. And you can think of birds that were north of there are interacting with birds that were south of there, east and west. So there's quite a bit of movement across the landscape. Um, I like to throw this one in just because it was an interesting one. We captured this bird on the stud mill road and 10 months later, somebody reported it um, in their backyard at their feeder. So another good example of that, that they're using different landscapes over, over the course of the year. Uh, I think I <clears throat> kind of described this, uh, the use of banding in informing harvest rate. Um, so we use total reported spring harvest um, with band reporting, and that how that helps us to estimate the spring population size. Um, the harvest rates for toms versus J jakes differ. There's more of a preference for 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 toms. Um, they're larger birds, and um, their harvest rates are quite higher than juveniles. So we looked at harvest rates between the two, um, and then we looked at the specific harvest rates at wildlife management districts. Um, and then banding can also help us understand how far birds are moving between or crossing WMD lines um, from winter to spring. And we saw quite a bit of that. This is a age old um, tool in statistics that's used in waterfowl harvest and other um, game species harvest where you take harvest registration data, which we have um, your total harvest, you put in um, the band numbers, the age, sex, year, and you basically come up with a harvest rate. And this is what we generated. And from that, you can take a harvest rate. And if you know your registration number, which we do, we have an accurate measure of the number of birds um, that are harvested in the spring. You can take your harvest rate and through that Lincoln estimator, generate a population estimate. And so for 2019, the reported harvest was 6,612 birds. Um, the band recovery was about 20% or the harvest rate was 20% averaged out between adult males and juvenile males. And so in 2019, we estimated that our spring male turkey population was 32,000. Um, and if you assume a 50-50 sex ratio, our spring wild turkey population was 65,000 in 2019. Now, it's important to think about what time of year you're estimating a population and um, how that influences your, your, your harvest modeling. Because um, if you looked at the population in the fall, you'd probably multiply that by four because you're looking at uh, reproduction too. So, and I just like to clarify this because a lot of people ask me what the population is for turkeys in Maine. And I use the spring, the spring measure because that's how we have, we have confidence in our data. But, um, you know, in the fall, it's quite a bit different, it's quite a bit larger. So I just have to uh, clarify that when people ask me about population estimates for turkeys in Maine. Um, we, I mentioned that disease was one component of the study that we were interested in looking at and how that might affect um, survival of turkeys and reproduction. And going back to the question about avian pox, this, these pictures are from 2012 and 2013, um, where we had a high rate of avian, this is 90% of these birds that had these lesions on the head were pox. There's another disease called LPDV, um, which doesn't present itself outwardly um, most of the time. 
but we did find that um, if there's a high prevalence of LPDV, lymphoproliferative disease virus um, in Maine um, during the study, 57%. Um, and we did look at how that might, how that influenced the, um, the vital rates of wild turkeys. And so we found that LPDV did, in fact, birds that were infected with LPDV, the clutch sizes were smaller, um, only by 1.5 eggs. So um, averaged out over, over the population, it wasn't um, a, a significant negative effect or influence on the total population of turkeys in any given year. Um, this other disease, REV, um, there's a 17% prevalence and birds did have lower survival, but the prevalence is much smaller. So both, um, both the diseases, although they do um, affect turkeys, it's not at a population um, detrimental level. Um, another thing we looked at too, with salmonella, that's been a big concern of uh, dairy farms is the amount of salmonella that turkeys might be um, bringing into feed piles when they're coming into feed. <clears throat> and we found like New Hampshire did in the early 2000s, and we also did in 2012 and 2014 that salmonella is still pretty low in Maine turkey. So there's really no, not a big concern of salmonella and how that might influence dairy production in the state of Maine or New Hampshire for that matter. Okay, so I know I just threw a bunch of stuff at you and I just threw this in to kind of recap that, you know, turkeys were native to Maine prior to um, European settlement and um, the loss of habitat and over, over hunting. They were gone by the late 1800s and then through series of funding and interest, they were restored to Maine and other states. They're very abundant in their core area, which is that lower, lower half of the, the state of Maine. Um, and we are trying to incorporate publicly derived goals and objectives to inform and in, um, our future wild turkey management. And so we just collected a bunch of data and we're still actually putting it all together. And there's some, the next steps are to, to take that into a more um, proactive management program. Um, I do wanna thank, there's, like I said before, there's several other folks that participate in wild turkey management and the research program. Um, the University of Maine was a big player. Um, several students assisted with captures and field work. We had a big field crew um, and regional biologists across the state and, and lots of volunteers. So that's a shout out to, to basically the army of people that helped to collect data. And uh, I'm gonna finish this last slide, which is the what's next. So I just gave you a bunch of information about information we collected and, and uh, questions we answered, but that really is just the beginning of what we're gonna do in terms of moving forward to try to have a, a more scientifically sound system to try to manage turkeys into the future. And so we have to incorporate, you know, assessments over time, learn, refine. It's basically another way of saying adaptive management, but trying to balance wise use with um, perspectives on how many turkeys should be on the landscape. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you so much. That was wonderful, Kelsey. Uh, we have two more questions that have come in and I'll invite anyone else with questions, please put them in the Q&A and we'll keep answering them until it's time to go. Uh, we, we have some time here. Uh, Bob wants to know, have you gotten Commissioner Camuso out turkey hunting yet? Uh, I haven't. Um, we have a fisheries biologist, biologist that took her out. Um, I, I think she took her out a couple of years ago. Yep. Okay. Uh, an anonymous attendee wants to know, are humans the turkey's only major predator? Ah, no, that's a really good question. Um, and it depends on what time of the year. So you have egg robbers uh, during nesting season. 
skunks, porcupines, different uh, small mammals. Um, and then you have owls that will take the young, um, bobcat, fox, they'll take the adults. So there's a, there's a long list of um, predatory species that capitalize on turkeys. Thank you. Um, Diane wants to know any plans to look at toxic contaminants or PFAS? Yes. Um, we're sampling next week, actually. And that, that, for those of you that aren't familiar with, well, PFAS itself is a, a toxin that's in a lot of our environment. But more recently, um, this past season, deer season, there was um, deer sample then around hot spots of PFAS. And there were significantly uh, elevated levels of, in, of PFAS in eight deer that were sampled. So next week and the week after, we're sampling wild turkey in the same area. Okay, thank you. Uh, Karen wants to know, so are the turkeys I see in my neighborhood in the spring different than the ones I see in the fall? Uh, yes. Um, yes and no. There's probably some that are the same. I mean, you have in the spring, you haven't had reproduction yet. So the you, there's young of the year from the previous year. In the fall, you have this year's reproduction. So you have new individuals on the landscape. But at the same time, the ones that you see in the spring, there's a very good chance that they are completely different adult individuals in the fall that you're seeing because of there's quite a bit of movement. Okay, and George, I think referring to this last slide of yours wants to know what's that acronym WMD? Ah, yeah, good question. I should have, I should have thrown up a WMD map. Um, the state of Maine in terms of wildlife management is divided into 30 wildlife management districts. So um, if you think back of that slide I showed in the core area, there's those wildlife management districts, WMDs, have different bag limits because of their density. So WMD is important in terms of regulating harvest based on population size. In specific locations. Yes, yeah. districts, wildlife management districts, yep. Any other questions coming in? Going once, going twice. Seeing none, thank you so much, Kelsey. Uh, we've really enjoyed this conversation and learning more about our wild turkey population. And this program has been recorded. So if you have any friends that wanted to be here tonight and missed it, we'll probably be posting it on our website and on the Facebook page. So thanks very much and have a good evening. Everybody stay warm, stay safe. And thanks again, bye-bye now. Bye.